All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the 10th annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I'm Leah Langby from the IFLIS Library System and I'm moderating the, moderating the management track today. And assisting me is Shauna Kaseki from the Southwest Library System. I'm really glad that you're, you're all here today. And our presenter for this session is Michelle Stricker from the New Jersey State Library. She will be discussing disaster response. Um, and Michelle, whenever you're ready, you can go okay. ahead and begin. Okay, thank you, Leah. And let me see if I can bring this up here. How's that? Can you see the screen? Uh -huh. Everyone? Not no. yet. No? Not yet. All right, so let me try this again. Um, I told you this would happen, right? Yep. It, of course, as usual, things work yes. great so, in the practice. Let me try this again. Hang on a sec. How about now? Hmm. Okay, this is not good. This did this did work a minute ago, right? It did. It sure <laughs> did. And we can we can if it if we can't get it to work, we can we have All other right. options. Hang on, let me share my screen. Let me try this again. Um you can see my screen. Here you are. This might do the trick. Uh, slideshow. How's that? that? Did the trick. That Great. did it. Terrific. All right. Thank you. Ooh, what a relief. Um, Ooh, all right. Thank you. Um, thank you for helping me work through that. And thank you, Leah. And hi, everyone. And thanks for having me back to the Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I really appreciate uh, the invitation. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about resiliency planning for libraries and their communities. And yes, this was built under something about, um, you know, resources that come from emergency management, but I, I promise you it's the same thing. I just changed the title of it. So I don't wanna throw you off if you came thick and you were here for one thing and that I did a bait and switch on you. So I'm gonna get started. And um, I want to say that the year 2021 was marked by 58 major disaster declarations throughout the United States with requests to FEMA for long-term recovery assistance. Seven of those disaster de declarations were the Colorado wildfires, the Kentucky, uh, Kentucky severe storms, flooding, and tornadoes, Arkansas with severe storms and tornadoes, New York had Hurricane Ida, and so did we in New Jersey. Louisiana had Hurricane Ida. Washington State had wildfires, and there was also the California wildfires. So in addition to the impact of these natural disasters, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to stress the capacity of essential workers and supplies. A community's ability to generate disaster resilience which is to effectively prepare for and bounce back from catastrophic events can help reduce the negative long-term impacts of a disaster. And the library plays a major role in helping restore a community to normalcy. I've presented on disaster preparedness so many times since Hurricane Sandy hit New Jersey in October of 2012. It was the worst storm in New Jersey's history. Then Hurricane Ida hit us last year, and Ida became the second worst storm in our state's history. And throughout the years, I have found so many different kinds of disaster preparedness. I've been confused, and then I think it must be very confusing for librarians and library staff to sort of sort through everything and decide what's the right approach to take and what are the right plans to fill out you know, for your particular situation. So in this webinar, I hope to simplify it for you by selecting what I consider to be the most essential disaster planning and response tools that are easy to use, even if you are a very small library. I'm going to introduce you to four essential resources that I modified from emergency management that will help libraries rebound from disasters quickly and restore library services to a community in crisis 
more rapidly than ever. Complete all four and they will set you on the path to resiliency, both for your library and for your community. So how do we create resilience in the wake of disasters? A key element to successfully recovering quickly from a catastrophic event lies in the overall preparedness of the whole community. A prepared community is a resilient community. Libraries need to be prepared to restore services as quickly as possible in the aftermath of a disaster in order to help the public with their emergency needs and to ensure a community returns to normal life as quickly as possible. However, helping a community return to normalcy requires a good bit of planning and then adaptability to respond to the crisis at hand. So it's like two sides of a coin, advanced planning and on the spot adaptability. The faster the response to restore library services, the faster you can provide essential information and resources and help to individuals and businesses within your own town. I recently attended a summit on natural disaster response and recovery sponsored by the New Jersey Association of Counties. I was the only librarian there. The rest were all elected officials. And I was struck by what was said by the keynote speaker, the New Jersey Department of Protection Commissioner. He said, after a disaster, and I'm quoting him, no one is coming to help you not for one or two days. And federal help like FEMA won't be set up on site for another seven to 10 days. So you can't count on federal resources right away. Now that's a long time to be without electricity, heat, air conditioning, food and basic necessities and shelter. Communities really are just a network of vulnerabilities. You have to rely on yourself meaning local resources like police, fire, community groups, neighbors, and the library. There is nothing your state can do to protect the community in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. So think about that and think about what was said. No one is coming to help you. And he also said that until 2050, storms will become more frequent and more intense. After that, if we take charge now to arrest climate change, those results will start to kick in. So in New Jersey, that means we're going to get a 20 to 50% increase in rain over the next 30 years. And it's not just the flooding that causes all the damage. I mean, everyone thinks that, you know, we get flooding in New Jersey because we're, we have the ocean coastline, but New Jersey actually had 775 wildfires last year. So taking our lead from the experts in disaster response, emergency management, first responders, and FEMA, the resources presented in this webinar have been modified to fit the needs of the library community. My goal was to develop new tools to help libraries prepare and rebound more quickly from a disaster while being relatively quick and easy to complete and implement. So the focus is on rapid response, agility, and scalability in order to restore library service in some form as quickly as possible. And here are the four resources I'll talk about today. I think that they are the most important tools you'll need for resiliency planning and response. All of these documents can be modified to fit your particular situation. There is no right way to complete any of these templates, and you'll understand why when I go over each of them individually. So right now we have the continuity of operations plan, which I'll be calling the COOP plan. And the COOP plan is like your new disaster plan. We have a seat at the table discussion guide that gives you credibility as a partner uh, working with local first responders like police and fire. Um, and, you know, I. They are the first responders, but I always like to refer to librarians as information first responders. We're gonna go over FEMA's uh, community tabletop exercises, and that's gonna put you in the seat as a facilitator for your community in helping them uh, get prepared for an emergency. And then the action plan is taken directly from the emergency responders playbook 
for rapid disaster response at the scene of an incident. So this is really a deck of tools that focuses on a complete resiliency planning rather than just like a typical emergency disaster planning. Resiliency planning versus disaster planning. What's the difference? While resiliency planning may contain elements of disaster planning, there are differences in focus, in the process, and object objectives. Resiliency planning generally takes a more holistic view of a community and not just of your library. Resiliency planning is highly participatory and engages the entire community especially the most vulnerable populations. Resiliency planning is forward-looking and considers long-term changes and response to environmental conditions, as well as being adaptable to accommodate uncertainties in the aftermath of a disaster. And resiliency planning is aspirational, emphasizing community self-sufficiency. So let's begin going over the tools and we're gonna start with the continuity of operations plan. The COOP becomes essential after a disaster once the library buildings and collections are stabilized. So in some libraries, especially in smaller libraries, the COOP has replaced the traditional disaster plan altogether. Now, I don't wanna imply that you can take shortcuts in your disaster planning and mitigation efforts but rather you will need a solid base of traditional disaster planning in order to get to the point where an abbreviated coup plan will work for you. And you will have to decide if that's the right decision for your library. The coup addresses how the library will reopen in some capacity and resume services to the public, even if you need to make building repairs and salvage parts of your collections. So it details how staff will manage day-to-day -day operations of the library after a disaster. Both the traditional disaster plan and the coup plan are an essential part of the library's disaster response and recovery toolkit. This is the best coup plan that I've seen, and it's been modified to fit libraries from the original Council of State Archivists pocket response plan known as the PREP plan. And the version that I'm going to give you and that I had already sent to Leah, I sent her, I think, three documents. The version I will give you has already been modified uh, for libraries and mostly for public libraries. You will need a small team to complete this document, which should only take a morning or an afternoon to do. And it's a two-sided document that folds up to the size of a credit card and fits into your pocket, hence the name. So the pocket size coup plan is the first document in your response toolkit. So here's the coup that I modified for libraries and sent to you in an attachment. Um, its actions have been color coded into teams responsible for mobilization activities, you know, such as website and social media updates, reopening plans, delivery coordination, communications with the media and community and more. And so you can see like the red team is the executive team, the blue team is the management team, um, and you know, on and on. Um, I know it, it's kind of hard to read here and it doesn't make for the most thrilling uh, PowerPoint, but I, I wanted to show you in the way it was laid out. And so that is the front page of the coup plan. You can change these categories if they don't fit for you. And this is the flip side. Um, the flip side lists historical um, collection salvage priorities. So is there something in your library that you know you, you, you need to get out right away and that you, that is irreplaceable? You're gonna list them here. You'll have resource contacts and a relocation strategy should your building sustain damage and you're unable to open again. And then you fold it up like a credit card, like I said, and you put it in your wallet so you always have it. Don't keep it in your desk drawer. So what is the difference between traditional disaster plans and the coup plan? Traditional disaster plans, and I'm sure you recall those 100 page templates, still have their place, but are ill-suited in an emergency because they are all about internal response to your facility and your collections. 
there's a good chance that your old library disaster plan has become outdated, sitting up there on a shelf somewhere, if you even know where it is. But before you start working with a quick coup plan, now is a good time to update it. The focus of the traditional plan is on mitigating risk to your library facility and salvaging your collections. And the coup plan is meant to augment it and move forward towards resuming services. Traditional disaster plans are overarching and may be relevant regardless of the type of disaster or emergency, whether it's natural or man-made. The key difference is that the coup document is a forward action that focuses on agility, getting the library open and running again to serve the community. There are many examples and templates for the traditional plans for free online, and you could choose the one that's best suited to your library or maybe none at all, if that's up to you. But perhaps the best known is the disaster preparedness template developed by the Northeast Document Conservation Center called D-Plan, and then there's D-Plan Lite for smaller institutions. So you have the link there and you have a few other links uh, to, to traditional disaster plans. You know, as I said, these plans focus on mitigating risk and salvaging collections and not on resuming essential services to the community. However, they do have their place since a library cannot reopen unless the building is stable, collections are salvaged, and regular library service even if it's limited, has been resumed. I just want to sidetrack for a moment here. Um, COVID-19 exposed a major flaw in disaster preparedness plans, and that is that they didn't work in a pandemic. We have a tendency to focus on natural and man-made disasters like chemical spills and civil unrest with the sole purpose of saving our buildings and collections and reopening to the public again as quickly as possible. Few libraries were prescient enough to foresee a worldwide pandemic that would cause a total disruption as life as we know it. And when you think about it, pandemics are nothing new and we've been warned for a long time that a big one was coming. Uh, pandemics have been around throughout all of history, like a smallpox and the Black Death, the Spanish flu, SARS. So why were we so taken by surprise? with COVID. But as a result of COVID, librarians and library staff had to respond quickly as the pandemic worsened and everything shut down, literally the opposite of what we planned for. However, during this long period of quarantine, libraries did an excellent job of pivoting to virtual services and programs, which have now become an integrated reality of our working life. Worth acknowledging here is the issue that not all people have access to online services due to multiple factors such as a lack of connectivity or digital literacy skills. And just look at how the schools have struggled with online learning in virtual classrooms. Two years later or more, and with Omicron raging, many thousands of children still can't get reliable Wi-Fi for school. And this pandemic has shown us that the, divisual, the digital divide remains worse than ever. Um, you can visit the ALA Pandemic Preparedness Planning site for a list of recommendations to follow for when the next pandemic hits. Let's hope that doesn't happen, but I'm sure it will. Um, or, you know, different variants uh, on uh, this one. It's going to put you in a better position to provide essential information and communication services to community members who are isolated, remote, disconnected, lack internet access, or use mobile devices exclusively. I also want to point you to the Librarian's Disaster Recovery and Community Resiliency Toolkit that was created by the New Jersey State Library. Um, this is what I call, uh, or I think of as the transition tool between a traditional disaster plan and the COOP plan. It's located on the New Jersey State Library website, and the resource was prepared as a guidebook and a companion workbook that features a series of quick checklists to complete a preparedness plan. And it was actually created from the emergency management point of view. So it's very different from the usual disaster preparedness plans that we've seen. 
The toolkit includes instructions for developing a resiliency plan for your library and a personal, personal readiness plan for staff. It then discusses how to modify your services to further meet the needs of your distressed community, which, you know, and you're all familiar with them by now, modifying your hours, reconfiguring library space for large crowds, offering more children's story times to keep them busy while the parents kind of work from the library and offering services such as char charging stations for personal devices. The toolkit really targets your role as an information first responder, focusing on what librarians can do for the community to help them recover from a disaster, as opposed to the life-saving priorities of emergency first responders. But it includes instructions taken directly from emergency management, such as a library safety warden program, a discussion of the incident command system, which is really the language, the default language of emergency response, a special section on crisis communications, and even with dealing with disruptive people. The toolkit was updated last year with a new chapter on pandemics, epidemics, and infestations. Because remember, I said none of the traditional disaster plans worked when COVID, when COVID hit. And it includes an operational checklist that highlights what actions librarians can take to prepare for a community-wide outbreak and addresses a number of other illnesses, such as the growing behavioral uh, disservices that a lot of our frontline staff are unfortunately um, have to deal with these days. So that's an explanation of your first tool, the one-page COOP plan, and a quick review of the traditional disaster plan. And also don't forget to look up the Librarian Disaster Recovery and Community Resiliency Toolkit uh, when you get a chance. I'm sure that you'll find some handy checklists you could use in your uh, preparedness uh, planning process. If you don't have to use them all, just uh, pull out what you think is relevant to you. So next we're gonna move on to a seat at the table discussion guide, working with disaster task force, and community volunteers. This guide was first created by, and this is a long name, the Disaster Information Management Research Center, DIMRIC, uh, of the US National Library of Medicine to suggest ways librarians can work with local emergency responders, including public safety, police, emergency planners, fire and rescue, along with local community nonprofits and volunteer organizations. So if it's a pandemic, your local public health uh, department is also going to be a resource for you. And especially in a pandemic, you'll want to listen to whatever recommendations they have about uh, quarantining in your own community. And as we've seen so many times now, libraries play a critical role in disaster recovery, serving as uh, recovery centers when they can be open, information and telecommunication hubs and warming and cooling stations. A seat at the table discussion guide is designed to help you start a dialogue with local and regional emergency responders so that the information resources you have to offer them and the community are remembered in a time of crisis. The discussion document includes a sample letter of introduction outlining the benefits of partnering with emergency personnel and a script for you uh, if you want to do follow up um, phone calls or letter writing or emails. And it also helps you write an elevator speech uh, so that you can communicate your value. It fosters an awareness of the vital role librarians play as information first responders as they communicate with elected officials and with what we call boots on the ground emergency responders who are typically short handed after a disaster as they're dealing with saving lives and stemming damages from the crisis at hand. Additionally, this guide will help you search out and partner with those faith-based groups and nonprofits in your community that are active after a disaster. You want to offer them a space in your library for their food and clothing drives and support them in any way that you can, as they offer critical aid to your neighbors. And this is how you start to build a whole community support team. 
in times of great need. It's essential that you make a connection with your local emergency responders and engage them as partners because they may not be aware of the important role libraries play in community resiliency. You have to approach them yourselves and tell them about what you have to offer. And this guide will help you begin thinking through the relationships you might need to build to have a seat at the table with disaster management in your town. And there's a, I've listed a couple of the discussion questions here. So you can see how you're gonna work through these with your own team at your own library. You wanna ask emergency management if you can join their conversations about things like risk assessment, mitigation, preparedness uh, planning that's in their area of coverage. Also ask to be incorporated into your county, state and local preparedness exercise scenarios and action plans because they're practicing these all the time. Start by establishing a primary point of contact at your local emergency management office. Request a seat at the table at their planning meetings, briefings, and updates, and realize that this partnership must be sustained, that training, outreach, and communication is an ongoing process and is probably going to be really reliant on you to keep those connections going. Make them realize the importance of getting the library open quickly after a disaster. They can help you by restoring power quickly, cleaning debris, doing minor repairs around the library facility. It's necessary that you remain high on their priority list so that you can reopen to provide services to the community. So you want to work on this plan together with emergency management. Funding really isn't needed or it's very, very minimal, and it should not be an obstacle in your partnership efforts. The same with your local nonprofits and volunteers who are frequently on the front lines, helping their neighbors, clientele, and communities recover. These groups step in immediately after a storm or a crisis, but often lack the resources to continue serving communities that need, need long-term help. So moving on, you now have your coup plan and you've established a working relationship with your um, local, uh, local emergency management and volunteer organizations. So now we come to the third tool in your resiliency planning, and that has to be outreach to your community. Resource three was developed by FEMA region two, and that's the uh, region that includes New Jersey, New York, and Puerto Rico. Um, so it's on the, um, all these scenarios are at the uh, website that I link on top specifically to region two. So um, this has to be about resiliency planning where you're outreaching to the community. And this helps train librarians and library staff on how to facilitate discussions within your own community to help people be safer, to be better prepared and more resilient where they work, live and play. The training introduces a series of easy to follow, what would you do scenarios. So as preparedness facilitators, which I'm calling you preparedness facilitators, librarians learn how to navigate this easy to use uh, disaster scenarios in several different areas. And they're all listed above there, hurricane, civil unrest, pet preparedness, wildfire, and, and, and more. These tabletop activities are designed to be low stress discussions to enhance an individual's or a family's disaster preparedness, perhaps by making go kits for themselves and their pets, uh, loading important documents onto the thumb drive, knowing evacuation routes, et cetera. Um, current outreach and community programs have been successful in connecting with and supporting non-traditional users. Building on these connections with individuals and families is critical in times of crisis. And libraries are uniquely positioned to assist and advocate for these group programs and in fact, have an obligation to do so. This outreach piece is critical in building community resiliency. So here's what one of those discussions looks like. This is an example that focuses like on a tornado warning. It describes up top the scenario and then asks, what would you do via a series of group discussion questions? 
It then gives you a link with further recommendations to see how you did. Uh, and, and what's great about this resource, really, it's like a ready-made program for you that you can facilitate with your community and that, that's practical and it's very helpful. It's meant to take place like as a small um, in-person group discussion uh, that they usually last about an hour, but you can easily adapt it uh, to a virtual event, you know, if your library is still closed uh, because of COVID or you're only doing curbside delivery. Uh, so it's easy to make it into a virtual uh, program. And to recap so far, we've reviewed the COOP, which focuses on re resuming library service, a seat at the table, which informs your discussions in partnership with local emergency management, and now the tabletop exercises, which allow you to serve as facilitators to help people in your community prepare for a disaster. And so then we're going to move on to the last resource in your um, resiliency toolkit. And this is the fourth document, the emergency action plan. And there's one key difference about this document from the last three. The EAP is the only document that cannot be on the whole completed before a disaster. The most important planning and response um, of the EAP takes place in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. So once again, taking our cue from emergency responders, librarians will need to quickly develop an emergency action plan at the point of crisis that considers the unique circumstances of a particular disaster. So for example, a flood that affects, say books in your teen section is gonna require a different response than if you have flooding in a computer lab or even a different, uh, different response if you have flooding you know, in the street outside, right outside the library. And a joint response saves effort, conserves resources and gets achieved more rapidly. And this is where the emergency action plan comes in. This short conditional plan requires you to quickly assess the situation at hand and then modify the appropriate response actions. Portions of the EAP may be completed ahead of time, such as the sections listing emergency personnel names and phone numbers, evacuation routes and utility company contracts, and it reminds me of the COOP plan in that way. However, the remainder of the document requires you to select the type of the disaster at hand, whether it's a fire, a flood, a chemical spill, um, extended power loss, extreme weather, a bomb threat, et cetera, and then to assign critical personnel to handle various aspects of the disaster and manage their assignments. The EAP is a lean, agile method to suit response to the need. It's the primary document employed in situational awareness as applied to disaster response. And I'm going to discuss situational awareness in a few minutes. The EAP is not a formal regulatory document, also not a FEMA document. I modified this EAP based on several forms I found online. And you should have it again in the documents that I submitted ahead of time. The most important element it's the action plan you create at the scene of impact as soon as danger has passed and response is needed. So the emergency action plan outlines what do we wanna do? Who is responsible for doing it? How do we communicate with each other? And what is the procedure if someone is injured? So after a disaster, there is this constant cycle of assessing and reacting to the incident or the crisis. So the EAP is about redoing and redoing and updating the plan over and over again until you get to what's called the recovery stage. Your library response team is continually assessing and prioritizing from the first few minutes after a disaster to days later to even months later. In the initial phase, you may not even have a chance to write it all down. Uh, remember, you know, we're still talking about the first few minutes after an incident occurs. So the response is often mental. I mean, you're not gonna just say to yourself, okay, let me stop and write this down first before I proceed. 
But eventually the action plan will be written down, you know, as soon as you possibly can and will be continue to be modified from there. Elements of the EAP include emergency personnel names and phone numbers, personnel who are trained in emergency response, evacuation route maps uh, that have been posted in each uh, work area with the following um, information marked, emergency exits, primary and secondary evacuation routes, locations of fire extinguishers, fire um, alarm pool stations and where they are in the library, and also assembly points if you have to meet outside of the library if you have to evacuate. And then there's types of emergencies that need to be reported by site personnel, uh, include medical, fire, severe weather, a bomb threat, chemical spill, extended uh, power loss, and other things like a terrorist attack and hostage taking. And you can see here, I, I put up a, a picture. FEMA has an entire book uh, on the incident. They call it the incident action plan rather than the emergency action plan. So if you really want to uh, learn even more about it, you can get that guide from FEMA, which I think it's free. It's downloadable. So I mentioned situational awareness, and it's important to be familiar with this term. Um, this term. Situational awareness is the ability to respond quickly and to adjust your response to the disaster at hand. It's about making the right decision at the right time. How you respond to the chaos happening around you and quickly assess and then activate your response is critical. It's really a mindset, not a skill. So situational awareness cannot be practiced like a disaster preparedness tabletop exercise, although you know, those activities are very helpful. Situational awareness is the ability to quickly assess what happened in order to craft an appropriate response to the specific situation at hand. The resources discussed throughout the webinar are gonna help you prepare for a situational response. They're designed to be agile, adaptable, and scalable. They're short and relatively easy to complete as compared to other disaster um, planning tools. And they focus on getting up and running again as quickly as possible. Again, always with the end goal of helping your community recover. Situational awareness means that you will make a critical assessment quickly that identifies actual and potential problems and to gauge the significance of each problem. Um, critical assessment always requires tackling the most significant problem first. And uh, priorities are always in this order, life and safety, incident uh, stabilization, preservation of facility and collections. This is the order of priority all emergency responders will follow when they arrive on the scene. So all of these resource guides and tools still require preparation time and implementation in advance, but they do represent a new approach to resiliency planning. When used together, these four resources will provide librarians with a much more responsive and situational approach to a crisis that enables a quick return to operations. Getting the library open and running again contributes to helping the community return to normal. The faster the community returns to normal and gets back to work, the more resilient it will be. So to recap, the traditional disaster plan helps to stabilize the library structure by securing utilities, health and hygiene, restroom facilities, water and collections. The plan is static and can be lengthy depending on the amount of detail and the size of the library. The COOP plan focuses on reopening the library for service to the community as quickly as possible. Services include internet access, reference service, a comfort station with heating and cooling, serving as an operations space or a telecommunication center, uh, food and clothing distribution center, and offering children's services, helping them also feel like there's some normalcy and there's some calmness when everything is going crazy around them. 
And then both the seat at the table document and FEMA's community preparedness facilitators program are the links to the community with a focus on resiliency. One positions the library as working alongside of emergency management and volunteer organizations, and the other features public programming with a focus on disaster readiness. The emergency action plan is the most agile document of the group. Based on plans used by emergency management, the EAP is implemented at the point of crisis and is meant to be adaptable and scalable. So really it's critical to take care of yourself and, and, and your family first in any kind of emergency. And hopefully as a library director, you know, you're going to realize that your staff and give them permission to take care of themselves first and their families first. But then you turn your attention to reopening the library so you can help your neighbors after a disaster. You know, and you can think of it as like a concentric circle where you're working outwardly. So in the center is you and your home. Then you're going to concentrate on work and what to do there and then on your entire community and your neighbors. And by using these resiliency planning tools, a library can rapidly stabilize its own infrastructure, um, restore essential services, customize operations to suit demand, and best of all, resume its role as the heart of, of a wounded but well-prepared community, helping all return to normalcy as quickly as possible. I just attended another um, conference the other day, and this one was put on again by emergency management. And we had somebody talking about um, information centers and he was from Australia. And I found it very interesting that emergency management is now starting to listen to the people in the community and how they respond to a disaster. So earlier on, I talked about the need for you to have a seat at the table, to have a discussion guide where you can approach emergency management and being included in their plans. Emergency management is starting to come around sort of to our side of things and the community side of things where, they're, where they said, you know, people in your community are very capable. They know what to do and they will come out to help. So maybe it's time emergency management starts taking our cue from the people in the community. And that's the way I think of the library. I think of you uh, not only as information first responders, providing help to your community, but I also think of you as a neighbor and a good neighbor, helping all the people around you in your own town. So I wanna thank you for your time. Um, I hope that you found the resources discussed to be helpful and informative. Uh, remember, you're all information first responders. Uh, you can email me at any time if you have questions about any of this. I'm always available. And um, thanks again. And I'll open it up right now if there's any questions. I think I, I got done a few minutes earlier, probably because I talked very fast. But um, I'll open up for questions. So Leah, is there any, anything that anyone wants, anyone wants to know that's uh, in Q&A or in the chat box? We did get one question, and I encourage you to, to, um, to share additional ones. Um, the first one is, how do we plan for staff well-being during and after a disaster? <clears throat> how to put on our own oxygen mask in these situations? Exactly. Um, so I kind of mentioned that a little bit. And, um, and you can almost take sort of the FEMA exercises that I, that I showed you because that is about individual and um, family preparedness. Um, you can share some of those with staff because it's very important that, you, that everybody, I mean, they're members of the community, they're your neighbors too. Um, they need to have their own personal and family preparedness plans in place. Um, and then, like I said, you need to give them permission if something happens, that if their home is damaged, if if their family is hurt, you have to give them permission to stay home and take care of what they need to take care of. But uh, in working through some of the scenarios um, and getting their own personal plans in place, that's sort of the best thing that they could do to be prepared. 
Um, it really, really just comes down to almost like household by household, block by block, um, in, in to be prepared for like a whole community emergency. Um, so yeah, so take a look at those FEMA scenarios. Um, some of the things that I really like, um, well, of course they may have generators at home um, and that's always a good thing. Uh, but one of the things that I really like is packing your digital go bag. If you have to leave uh, really quickly, having all your important documents on like a thumb drive. I think that's a great um, exercise to do. Um, and I also uh, would encourage everyone to remember about uh, pet preparedness because that's really a big thing. And emergency responders have learned that people are not going to leave if they can't take their pets with them. So uh, focus on the people first, but don't forget the pets. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> related to that, we had a, um, if, a question about if um, just dealing with the secondary trauma that sometimes library staff are subject to. Um, any thoughts about that? Just like when a whole community is going through a, a disaster, um, do you have any thoughts about that? Like emotional well-being as well as physical? Yeah, and you know, it's sort of, in a way I think of it part and parcel of the entire thing, what, you know, you may be wounded, not outside, but mentally. And um, I know that, uh, I, I mean, look at the, what's going on now where people are coming in libraries and, you know, they're, they, just the mental health of everyone after two years of COVID is just, really everyone is suffering. So, you know, in giving them, first of all, you know, at the state library, I know they offer a lot of programs to us individually for our mental health that we could take, you know, to help us. And so I would always recommend that you offer these kind of uh, programming to your staff on an ongoing basis, you know, so they can focus on their mental health. There's a lot of like I know in New Jersey, there's we have the Mental Health Association in New Jersey. They have like weekly call ins where you could just call and talk. It doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you have to have some kind of a, you know, a mental illness in order to call in. It just means that they acknowledge the stressfulness of the situation and, you know, they encourage librarians to call in and just have like a weekly discussion. So you want to sort of knowing that this has been going on for so long for the pandemic or, you know, look at what happened like in Kentucky with all those tornadoes, um, you know, the, the people are in shock over that. Um, you know, you have to do what you can to have people take care of themselves, offer them some resources, and then give them the time off, you know, if they need it. You're not mental health experts. We're not mental health experts. We can't diagnose, you know, we can only give information, offer some, you know, offer some programming from the people that really know um, what they're talking about. So that's what I would do. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, do you have any suggestions for encouraging staff members to participate in planning if they think talking about preparedness is a waste of time? <laughs> well, you know, hopefully if you have these shorter documents, they may not, it may not be such a waste of time. I kind of I kind of know what they're talking about with a lot of the long plans that may take like forever to complete. But, um, you know, hopefully these are a lot of shorter, um, shorter documents. So you won't be that or as tedious, I should say, to, to fill fill them out. Um, you know, you could require them to do so. But also um, a lot of libraries have what, you know, it's like they're disaster response team or their crisis management team. So not everyone in your library has to be part of the of disaster preparedness. You kind of have to know your staff um, and you could have just, you know, uh, six, eight, 10, four, whatever it is at your library. Uh, you could have your disaster team put together um, and these will be the main people who will deal uh, with an emergency should one happen. Um, and we'll be the ones responsible for really uh, filling out all of the forms. But um, what I also encourage you to do 
is whether or not your staff is engaged on it on a regular basis, at least once a year, have some kind of a, you know, preparedness drill, a tabletop drill, uh, where you're going to simulate some kind of emergency and what the responses will be. Um, they're, they're very helpful should, should something happen, um, you know, that at least they have sort of a framework to know, to know what to do. So at least they could participate once a year. All right, excellent, thank you. Um, okay, so Rita says, this isn't just a policy we're writing. Should we be looking at this with other libraries once or twice each year to, to help develop that right, correct, ready mindset? You know, working with a with a group of libraries, you know, is is always a great idea because you can back each other up. Um, you know, if your services go down, you know, a library in another town may, you know, you may have a some kind of memorandum of understanding or agreement that they will, you know, they will help the people from your town. They'll allow in this situation for you know, X amount of time after a disaster that they're gonna allow the people in your town to come over and use their, their computer labs or whatever it is. So not only can you share you know, resources in that way and be a help to each other, but also I've seen uh, a number of libraries uh, sort of team up together and share um, like a cache of disaster supplies, you know, whether they're, um, you know, uh, fans or uh, booms that kind of absorb water and uh, tapes and different things, that, you know, to salvage collections. Um, I've seen libraries come together, share the cost of um, putting a disaster preparedness cache and decide uh, where to keep it. Um, and I'll give you one example. We had that done uh, in one of the counties in New Jersey, and it was actually kept on in the parking lot of one of the libraries which had, which had like the um, like the uh, the storage unit of like an 18 wheeler truck on their property. And so all the supplies were kept in there. And literally what would you know what they could do if there was a, an emergency is like back the cab up and hook this thing up to it and drive right off to whatever library you know had the emergency. So yeah, if you can if you can uh, form some sort of an alliance, that's a that's a great idea, and it would be a really big help to you. Excellent. How about um, well, we just have a, a um, just we have a couple more minutes. So if you have other questions, but um, Linda sent in a comment um, just about uh, her experience in Manatee County, Florida where every county employee had an emergency response role. Um, the libraries, the plan was for libraries to be volunteer reception centers and for the library staff to work at the volunteer reception centers during recovery. So they planned and prepped for the role and collaborated with local nonprofits monthly to work together to respond to the community when a disaster occurred. That's <clears throat> so that's just that's one amazing. cool example, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's amazing, um, you know, in 2012, we did 2013. 2012 is when uh, Superstorm or Hurricane Sandy hit uh, New Jersey, and in 2013, we actually had a conference called Courts in the Storm that brought together libraries, FEMA, um, emergency responders, and the, the Red Cross and other nonprofit organizations. Uh, we had the NJVOAD and New Jersey Volunteers operating after disasters, and. Um, the fact that you're able to, and you know, we talked about the libraries being these, you know, centers, these information centers, or you know, these um, or it's in a storm. You know, this is where people are going to come after a disaster. And what we found uh, after that particular um, storm, Hurricane Sandy, is whether the libraries were ready or not, everybody showed up at their door in the community the very next day. So, um, you know, the thing about the library is everyone knows where it is. Uh, every, even if they're non-users, they know where the library is in your town. And so um, we sort of wanted to formalize exactly what you're doing, having libraries be like that information center, the communications hub, the recovery center, 
for the community. And um, we do talk about ways, you know, to actually do that. And what I think is great about what you mentioned is that you're meeting monthly with, um, I think, your volunteer groups. And that is absolutely key. I mean, um, you know, uh, I talked about earlier on in the seat at the table guide of uh, reaching out to your um, volunteer organizations. And, you know, they are really the people that are really going to be out there after an emergency. Um, you have your local CERT team. Uh, you have your faith-based groups that are going to be involved. And the fact that you keep up with them and meet on a monthly basis is awesome because that means that you've got that network well-established, you know, if something happens. And we all know, you know, Florida is very prone to bad weather and hurricanes. So um, I think that's excellent. Well, and it does seem like those, those connections are useful in non-disaster times too. So those, those relationships. Yeah, the, the one thing I wanted to mention about that also is, you know, we have to be careful when we use the, the term uh, recovery center because, you know, there are um, FEMA designated recovery centers. And these are um, locations that are pre-certified by FEMA. So they, so they have things in place and they're ready to, you know, to have FEMA come on site and hook up whatever it is they need to hook up so that they can start providing, you know, relief to the people in the community. So for the most part, libraries are not FEMA certified recovery centers. A few of them are, but not every library can be a FEMA certified recovery center because FEMA simply does not have the resources. Um, they're very expensive to set up and you know, FEMA just can't do that for every single library. So if you wanna call yourself a recovery center, um, just be clear that FEMA also uses that term and that you are not an official, you know, officially designated recovery center. And also, at least in New Jersey, um, libraries, you know, do not uh, shelter in place. There's no, I mean, shelters. They have not served as community shelters for people. All righty. Thank you. And I'm looking at the time. We have just three minutes left. And I'm just going to mention another comment that a uh, participant said, uh, don't forget your local Department of Public Health or of Health. They have resources as well. Exactly. And they're very important, especially in the pandemic. And we would get a lot of calls throughout the COVID to the state library from the libraries in New Jersey. And they would say, well, what should we do? Or, you know, are we, are we, what do you want us to do? Do we need to close our doors? When can we reopen? How, and, you know, we were not, we are not able to say that, you know, we are not the experts and we would always refer them um, to the local uh, department of health. Excellent. So great, great suggestion. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for a great session. I think everyone is hopefully feeling a little more prepared or, or ready to get prepared. <laughs> um, I hope so. Uh, yeah, we'll have a short survey at the end of the webinar um, sent to your email, and we do appreciate that feedback. Um, well, thank you so, for having me. I really appreciate yes. being here. Yeah, and our, our presenter for the next session is Emily Rogers. Um, with the Brown County Library Service. She'll be talking about onboarding. And um, if you, uh, yeah, if that starts at 2.30, um, we'd love it if you could join us for that. And if not, uh, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And thank you again, Michelle. Oh, thank you, Leah, my pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.